A decades-old cold case, new clues could link infamous serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer to another Wisconsin man's murder. 12 News investigates a filmmaker and a detective's quest for clues to solve the case. Here's Hillary Mintz. Jeffrey, I hate you! It was something only worst nightmares are made of. 17 men brutally murdered at the hands of the serial killing cannibal Jeffrey Dahmer. Three decades later, there are new questions about Dahmer's link to an 18th victim, a similar calling card left at a crime scene halfway across the country. Less than a year before Dahmer's arrest, police in Los Angeles were investigating the murder of 25-year-old Billy Newton, also known by his stage name, Billy London, an actor from Eau Claire. He left a nightclub in West Hollywood Halloween weekend of 1990, his body parts found in a dumpster the next day. It's truly a mystery. Now an L.A. filmmaker, Rachel Mason, who considers herself an amateur sleuth, is using her movie-making skills to generate tips on the case. We can't, you know, deny the fact that a person did bring new testimony in Los Angeles which could really, truly help a cold case. Mason's working on a documentary about Newton's unsolved murder. She says she discovered the case while working on a Netflix film about her parents' adult bookstore located near where Newton was killed. His family deserves to know what happened to him. Did you ever wonder if it was Jeffrey Dahmer? I did, I did. Billy's sister, Michelle Oliver, lives here in Milwaukee, living with the mystery of who killed her brother after he left Wisconsin. You know, this does kind of you know, match up to his M.O. And so it was always in the back of my mind. Her brother's cold case now heating up. And I was there the day that Billy left the bar and was never seen again. Ron Wheeler told 12 News he believes he saw Dahmer leave the club with Newton that night. The man that I saw that day I recognized as Jeffrey Dahmer. Despite reporting the sighting to police years ago, a recent podcast reignited his memory. It's something that really has stayed with me all of these years that perhaps I should have done more at the time. Perhaps I should have said more at the time. Now his tip has reopened the investigation. So when you get a tip like that all these years later, where do you even begin? You begin by uh, cracking open the old case file. LAPD homicide detective John Lamberti gave 12 News a look at the piles of documents he's pulled out of the cold case file. There's five giant three ring binders full of investigation files and they ran down every lead. In those files, Dahmer's mugshot, fingerprints, and a signed letter from a Milwaukee police captain after questioning him about Newton's murder. Did Jeffrey Dahmer, was that ever a possibility? The investigating detectives obviously knew about Dahmer's arrest because it was national news. They immediately thought of this murder. Dahmer denied the California crime. He was a very careful, clever criminal. Perhaps no one knows the Dahmer case better than the man who put him away. Do you think it's possible that Jeffrey Dahmer killed a man in California and got away with it? It's possible, but I don't think it's highly likely that he killed 16 people in Wisconsin, one person in Ohio, but not elsewhere. And when suspicion has arisen about what he may have done elsewhere, that usually falls flat. That's not to say he didn't do it in California. Detective Lamberti isn't convinced. I can't just take somebody's denial at face value. People lie to me all the time. He says Dahmer's timeline is critical, but difficult to trace. I've been able to figure out, you know, where he was the week before this murder and the week after this murder, but I haven't been able to track down any sort of official document that, that shows that he was in Milwaukee at the time of this murder. There's a week you don't know where he was, and that could be critical in this case. Right, and, and there were no victims in Milwaukee during that time. This vacant, fenced-off lot here near 25th and State is where Dahmer's apartment building once stood, and it's where police found remains of several of the victims. Now this filmmaker and detective are hoping somebody here in Milwaukee might be able to place Dahmer in Los Angeles at the time of the murder. There's one more reason police believe Dahmer might have gone to the West Coast. His mother lived in Fresno, which is about four hours away from from where this murder happened. The similarities to Dahmer's MO are striking. People usually don't dismember their victims, and obviously the rest of Billy's body has never been found. Fresno police did find a severed foot. According to this Milwaukee police report, Dahmer denied that too. The report reads, quote, Jeffrey Dahmer states he has never been in California, specifically Fresno, and denies any involvement in this offense. 
Without high-definition security cameras, digital footprints, and DNA testing, Lamberti says they're relying on old-fashioned information. You never know what that little piece of information might be that might help put, all, put this all together. And you want closure, and you don't get it. What would it mean to you and your family to find out what happened and who did it? For my personal, you know, it would mean a lot to know what happened to my brother. In Milwaukee, Hillary Mintz, WISN 12 News. We did ask Milwaukee police about this new lead. They would not comment on the case. Jeffrey Dahmer was killed by a fellow prisoner in 1994. If you have any information that could help, we have posted a link to the 12 News app to submit a tip. Turning now to WeatherWatch 12 here on this Sunday evening. Daji, a gorgeous end of the weekend, but the cold makes a comeback for Monday. Yeah, we're going to be grabbing some extra layers for tomorrow. Check this out. Temperatures are still in the upper 20s right now in Brookfield. Roads look good. However, I am concerned about some freezing drizzle that is moving across the area. We'll show you the radar in just a moment, but temperatures are still very warm. 26 in the Fond du Lac, 30 in Eagle, and 27 out to Wheatland. Also in the upper 20s out to Versailles and Kenosha compared to this time yesterday. That's about 10 to even near 20 degrees uh, warmer than this time yesterday. So a huge different th difference there. And that's because those winds have been coming out of the south throughout much of the day and southwest. Now we're starting to see that front. You can kind of see that depicted here where those winds are converging. Winds more out of the northwest. That northwest wind is going to drag in the colder air, but also going to allow for some sunshine as we head into our Monday. Before the sunshine, we have clouds and we have some moisture developing, bringing in some freezing drizzle across portions of southeastern Wisconsin. And wherever you see those little pink speckles, that does include portions of Waukesha, even past uh, Madison there looking at the chance for some slippery roadways. Now, don't think this is going to be a huge impact, but any elevated surfaces could be dealing with some extra slippery conditions. So take your time if you do have to travel overnight. As far as tomorrow, here is a look at the breakdown. We'll start with temperatures in the teens, wind chills in the single digits. Some areas could be at zero by the afternoon, lower 20s and will continue to rise into the mid 20s for for most for tomorrow, we are below average. And once again, those wind chills are not on the warm side by any means, staying in the teens, feeling like the teens throughout much of our Monday, but it comes with sunshine. So if you do need to wash the car, you'll have the opportunity to do that. Tuesday also looking like a great day. Ben and I were talking earlier about how some of you were waiting in line. Don't wait in line. Maybe go on Monday, Tuesday when some people are at work. Wednesday, we'll be looking at the better opportunity for some uh, snow showers and rain to mix in. And that's because we'll be noticing our temperatures going up. So that's why we have the potential for some rain. 26 here tomorrow. Once again, grab the extra layers. Tuesday, sunglasses, but you can shed some of those layers as we head into the afternoon. 36 for the high. Upper 30s on Wednesday. Rain and snow chances will continue to be a concern as we head into our Thursday and Friday. I do believe Thursday is mostly cloudy, but by Friday, those rain chances come back into the forecast. We'll hold into the 30s for a good period of time here this week before the 20s try to return into next weekend. There must have been people who waited an hour to get a car wash today. The couple places that I drove by, the line was around the building out under the street. Dedication that I don't have. Yeah, that, me either. You can't tell. My car is black and you can hardly tell. So, yeah. all right, Daji, thank you. Well, are there mysterious objects in the Wisconsin sky or are they nothing more than science fiction? Kent Wainscott is investigating Wisconsin's UFO sightings and what's behind the thousands of reports dating back decades. Well, I think there's probably an explanation about it somewhere. Right at dusk here in downtown Port Washington, reports of a strange shaped something in the northern sky. One of Wisconsin's most recent reports of a UFO. I get plenty of calls uh, from people that, that want, to, want to report something. I've never seen it, but it might be out there. It was something, it was something. What did you see? 12 News investigates UFO sightings in Wisconsin. That's Monday on 12 News at 10. Protest in Minneapolis after a fatal police shooting. A man killed during a no-knock warrant, something that was supposed to be restricted. The new information tonight. Plus, Giannis and the Bucks look for back-to-back -back wins on the West Coast. Stephanie Sutton is in next with sports.
Know first when severe weather is headed your way. Customize alerts for your neighborhood. Download the 12 News app right now and stay safe. Big 12 Sports, presented by Menards. So far, the Bucks are making their tough West Coast road trip look oh so easy. They beat the Trailblazers last night by 29 points, and tonight Giannis and company remain hot against the Clippers in L.A. Let's head to Crypto.com Arena. First quarter, Drew Holiday feeding Giannis for the two-handed stuff. Giannis with his 19th straight game with 25 or more points, finished with 28. Then Chris Middleton with the turnaround jumper hits the buzzer beater at the end of the first quarter. A little later, the Greek freak with the circus shot down the lane gets the hoop and the harm. Newly signed Greg Monroe in the lane, nothing but net. Moose looking good in his second stint with the Bucks so far. The Bucks had not one but two buzzer beaters in the first half. Bobby Portis coming off a 30-point game in Portland. Shakes his head after that three-pointer makes it in to end the first half. Bucks up 11 at the break. And then Pat Connaughton started to heat up in the third quarter. He had back-to-back-to-back three-pointers. Six three-pointers overall. And Drew Holiday looking all Hollywood out in L.A. He had 27 points. The Bucks win a back-to-back out west tonight's final 137 to 113. Shaka Smart and 24th ranked Marquette off the past few days. They are back in action Tuesday night in a top 25 matchup on the road at UConn. As for the 11th ranked Badgers, they are coming off a win over Penn State this weekend and travel to number 13 Michigan State on Tuesday and look to avenge a loss from earlier this season. The Spartans dominated Wisconsin at the Kohl Center a couple weeks ago. But the Badgers were playing without Tyler Wall, who missed that game with an ankle injury. And he could be the difference maker this time around. It hurt, it hurt to watch that game, you know, I really wanted to be out there, but 
I'm just hungry to get out there and kind of avenge that loss that we shouldn't have lost. I think that kind of gives me an advantage to kind of take a step back and see how things really are, okay. not necessarily in the heat of the moment, and kind of just take mental notes for when we're going to play them this week. College Hoops, UW-Milwaukee on the road earlier today at Cleveland State. DeAndre Golston hits a couple of triples here. He led the way for the Panthers with 14 points. Second half, watch Tafari Sims a drive to the hoop for the one-handed dunk. But the Vikings had four players in double figures. UWM loses 84-71. to Back here in Milwaukee, Marquette women in Creighton in an intense Big East matchup. The Golden Eagles' Jordan King with the jumper here to take the lead. So the Golden Eagles up by one. Then former Homestead High star Chloe Marana with a huge offensive board there. And then a big block on the Blue Jays in the final seconds of this one. And Marquette wins a nail biter at the L, 50 to 47. The Badger women beat Illinois 70 to 62. And coming up in our second half hour, highlights from the Pro Bowl. I don't know if they're highlights, kind of low lights. The Wasn't plays, the plays that happened on television. Yeah, no Packers played, but Matt LaFleur was the head coach of the NFC team. Right. A lot of fun to be a basketball fan in Wisconsin. Yeah, it is fun yeah. right now. All right, Steph, thank you. A big ice rescue this weekend. The Coast Guard pulls more than a dozen people from Lake Erie. We'll tell you how they got stranded. Had Russia's troop build up on the border of Ukraine as the White House says that an invasion could happen anytime. Leading the way with important local coverage. You're watching WISN 12 News at 10. U.S. troops arrived in Poland today, part of a 3,000 member force heading to Eastern Europe. That's as the White House warned that Russia could attack Ukraine at any time. ABC's Mona Kosar Abdi shows us the buildup of Russian troops on the Ukraine border. 
As the first contingent of U.S. troops arrives in Poland to shore up NATO allies in Eastern Europe, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan is warning of a possible Russian attack against Ukraine. We believe that there is a very distinct possibility that Vladimir Putin will order an attack on Ukraine. Uh, it could take a number of different forms. It could happen as soon as tomorrow, or it could take some weeks yet. ABC News has learned the U.S. now estimates that Russia has 70 percent of the forces in place that would be needed to invade Ukraine. From special operations troops to tanks and artillery to air and naval forces, new satellite images show Moscow's military buildup in neighboring Belarus. If they choose to go down the path of escalation instead, it will come at enormous human cost to Ukrainians, but it will also, we believe, over time, come at real strategic cost to Vladimir Putin. President Joe Biden spoke with French President Emmanuel Macron on Sunday ahead of Macron's meeting with Putin on Monday in Moscow. The two discussing ongoing diplomatic and deterrence efforts. The president deflecting when asked about sending more U.S. troops if Putin does not de-escalate the situation. I'm not going to speculate on that. Military aid continues to arrive in Ukraine's capital, Kiev, part of a $200 million package from the United States. But some Republicans are criticizing the administration for not doing enough. I'm working with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee on a, a bill that we hope to get out this week that will stand up the deterrence for the administration's failed to provide not only the lethal aid to Ukraine, but also the sanctions necessary, devastating sanctions. Monaco Sarabdi, ABC News, New York. If you want to know the history behind the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, we have an explainer up right now on the 12 News app. A car caravan protest in Minneapolis tonight over a fatal police shooting. Officers killed a 22-year-old man while conducting a no-knock warrant. ABC's Ike Jaji shows us the growing outrage. Tonight, new information surrounding the execution of a no-knock warrant that ended in the shooting death of 22-year-old Amir Locke during a Wednesday morning Minneapolis police raid. Body camera footage shows police using a key to enter the apartment where Locke was apparently sleeping. An officer since identified as Mark Hanneman firing at least three shots, killing Locke, who was holding a gun less than 10 seconds after entering. Back in November of 2020, city officials restricted the use of no-knock warrants as part of a series of reforms enacted in the wake of the death of George Floyd. But according to the Minneapolis Star Tribune, the practice continued, court records revealing that police applied for and obtained more than a dozen such warrants since the start of the year. In Locke's case, police insisted a standard search warrant be upgraded to a no-knock warrant. They've so far declined to explain what led to the change. This weekend, the city was full of protesters calling for the mayor and interim police chief to resign and the officer involved to be fired and prosecuted. Locke's family taking part in the demonstrations. How dare you take my son from me and his mother? Police say Mark Hanneman has been placed on administrative leave pending an investigation of the incident, and the mayor has now issued a complete moratorium on no-knock warrants while the Minneapolis Police Department undergoes a review led by outside experts. Ike Jachi, ABC News, Washington. Yesterday marked two years since the first COVID case was identified in Wisconsin. The U.S. just passed 900,000 COVID-related deaths. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says 64% of the U.S. population is now fully vaccinated. In Wisconsin, the number is 59.5%. One in five Americans have not received any COVID vaccine. If you're looking for a place to get a COVID vaccine, you'll find resources up right now on the 12 News mobile app. Is the 2024 Republican National Convention headed to Milwaukee? A delegation is just back from Salt Lake City after making the pitch. Adrian Pedersen has the new inside scoop tonight on Upfront. Good evening. Milwaukee is one of four finalists to host the RNC. The group met privately with officials during their winter meeting in Salt Lake City. Peggy Williams Smith, president and CEO of Visit Milwaukee, was there, and she'll bring us the inside private pitch. Plus, early voting is underway in Milwaukee's mayoral primary. Tonight, we're grabbing a cup of coffee with all the candidates, asking how they'll work with state lawmakers. And another lawmaker not seeking re-election, Democratic Minority Leader Janet Buley tells us why and what she's working to stop 
drop in the weeks ahead. It's all coming up tonight at 11 o'clock, so be sure to stay with us right after this newscast. The Coast Guard rescued 18 people tracked on a chunk of ice in Lake Erie. This picture from a rescue helicopter shows the group stranded today near Sandusky, Ohio. The Coast Guard says that a huge chunk of ice broke away while people were snowmobiling. All 18 were taken back to land. No one needed any medical attention. The Coast Guard says to take precautions when you're out, and there is no such thing as safe ice. And you may remember this scene, kind of proving their point. On this date in 2016, six years ago, 15 cars broke through the ice of Lake Geneva. They have been parked on the lake for Winterfest, and the ice was too thin to support them all on Geneva Lake. That was a mess, Daji. Uh, thankfully, today we haven't seen any reports of anything like that around here, although it certainly was a lot warmer today. Yeah, we're going to be worried about some thawing conditions as temperatures are going to be fluctuating throughout this week. Snow cover is likely to go down as temperatures are going to be on the mild side. Now for tonight, still want you to be weather alert as we are looking at the chance for freezing drizzle, already seeing some of that out to Sullivan, and that's likely to continue to press further to the south and east here tonight. So any overnight driving need to be very, very calm. Cautious. Over the next 12 hours, temperatures will dip into the teens by tomorrow morning. We'll get some sunshine, so that's fantastic, but the temperatures are much colder compared to today where we hit highs in the 40s. Instead, we'll be topping off at 26 degrees Tuesday, 36 and Wednesday. We're also feeling mild. We are going to see the opportunity for some midweek snow, but outside of that, for the next several days, we are on the dry side. We helped each other. We worked with each other. An all-female, all-black battalion that served overseas in World War II is on the last leg to finally receive recognition for their accomplishments. The 6888, the Central Postal Directory Battalion, is credited with clearing a backlog of two years of mail after D-Day in 1944. The Army thought it would take six months to clear the backlog just in Birmingham, England, but they reduced the backlog in three months. They never got a parade. They never got a salute. The Senate unanimously passing a bill for that unit to receive the Congressional Gold Medal, but it's awaiting action in the House. Only six of the original 855 in the battalion are believed to still be alive. As Black History Month continues, Milwaukee Film is showcasing more projects by black creators all month long. This Thursday, there is a film screening of Black Love Through a Black Lens, short films program at, Orient at the Oriental Theater. That starts at 630. Saturday afternoon, the Oriental is also hosting a free screening of the movie Citizen Ash. The film tells the story of tennis legend and civil rights activist Arthur Ashe. And Saturday night, there will be an event at Dandy focusing on the portrayal of black women in media. For a full list of Black History Month movies, head over to our website, WYSN.com. Our person of the week is a Milwaukee woman experiencing homelessness who received a life-changing gift from dozens of strangers. Ashley Lagoo McKinney and her three-year-old daughter, Leanna, have been without a home since Ashley left a bad relationship in November. Struggling to find housing, shelters in Milwaukee couldn't accommodate her disability. She and Leanna accepted a spot at the Salvation Army in Sheboygan. After a few weeks feeling isolated and alone, she reached out to GoFundMe for help. But I was just happy for 200. I was like, oh, I got, I'm getting support. And then when I looked on it, it was 13,000. And I was just like, oh my God, like I cried a little. And then it's just like, it's just, it's overwhelming. And you're like, you can't believe it. That GoFundMe now has more than $114,000. Ashley says she's looking to buy a home and can now take her time. We wish her all the best of luck.